good evening everyone i welcome you all on behalf of sherlock institute of forensic science we are presenting today a lecture on forensic taxonomy uh, identification of chemical biomarkers for forensic medicine our uh, today's instructor is dr jonathan andre brooks thank you jonathan for accepting our invitation for uh, giving the uh, lecture on the topic this is uh, much required uh, i welcome you uh, on behalf of sherlock institute of forensic science with my moderator priya singh i request priya to uh, give a brief introduction about our today's instructor dr jonathan brooks who is the director of forensic training uh, in integrates global consultancy so priya over to you yes um, i would like to introduce uh, dr jonathan brooks uh, he has completed his bachelor science degree in forensic science as at tesidus university where he undertook his dissertation in conjunction with durham police dog unit investigating the chemical odor profile of blood in the intent to improve the accuracy and efficiency of blood detection dogs he then went on to complete his doctorate in chemistry with forensic applications from the university of lancaster investigating the volatile organic compounds expelled from and around the composing specimens in the intent of developing greater training aids for cadaver dogs as well as so change the slides it's already changed here uh as well as the creation of a more accurate method of determining postmortem interval during his phd he lectured at numerous universities both nationally and internationally in specialist forensic subjects forensic taxonomy but also around the presence of specialist forensics at scene of crime jonathan delivers specialist forensic capabilities around the search and recovery of human remains which include the delivery of training and consultancy to a to a law enforcement agencies both to uk home office and international law enforcement agencies this includes forensic medicine forensic taxonomy forensic archaeology and forensic anthropology as the director of forensic training at integritas global consultancy jonathan manages the research aspects of the company collaborating and communicating with universities and forensic institutions worldwide to develop a world class research center This research fuels the training of policing staff, crime scene investigators, and forensic practitioners to ensure that quality, that quality and effective training is delivered. Thank you so much, Priya, for introducing our today's speaker. So, with this, we welcome again John for uh, today's uh, lecture, and uh, thank you for thank you once again for accepting our invitation for delivering a lecture. John, uh, now the session is yours. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, thank you for the Sherlock Institute for allowing me to speak today. Um, I'll just share my screen if I haven't done already. So, there you go. Brilliant. Yes. So, thank you again for allowing me to talk today, uh, and thank you for the introduction. So, quite a worldwide um, kind of um, experience in in the area of forensic taxonomy. Uh, and my role predominantly is to look at the research aspects and the training and how they interlink with each other for Integritas Global Consultancy. Uh, and today I'll be talking about forensic taxonomy and specifically the biochemical aspects. So we've had previous talks about kind of what forensic taxonomy is uh, and how that can be um, presented in a court of law, both nationally and internationally. But we're going to concentrate on more the kind of the, the chemistry, the biochemical approach. So just to touch on this slightly, so forensic taxonomy kind of explores all avenues of decomposition. So it's a multidisciplinary approach to understanding how humans decompose and how we approach that from a criminal investigation point of view. Now, the word taxonomy predominantly had come from uh, another field, um, paleontology, where they looked at the actual preservation of the remains and how you actually have that preservation period and how that you can actually see fossils uh, and, and, and actually visualize that. Now for forensic applications, there are two avenues. It's the identification of volatile organic compounds. Um, so the application of cadaver dogs 
uh, and then looking at biological markers to improve post-mortem intervals, so time since death. So can we actually look at the biochemical degradation of human tissue to establish a time since death uh, and in the near future look at other variables, for example, um, narcotics um, and other variables like um, presence at a scene. Now, in my opinion, forensic taphonomy really links two of the subjects that we all are most aware of. Um, you have forensic pathology that looks at cause of death, uh, and you have forensic anthropology, which can also look at cause of death. But forensic taphonomy really binds those two subjects together because we're actually understanding how the body has transitioned from that state of um, death into that skeletal matter where anthropologists start to really thrive and start to investigate um, what's actually happened to that time. From my aspect, what I am more interested in is looking at what the reaction mechanisms occur during decomposition. If we start to understand the reaction mechanisms, we then start to look at unique biomarkers and how that really contributes to our understanding of whether we can actually determine time since death and what other actual chemicals that cadaver dogs are indicating too. You see the left hand side is um, uh, uh, skeletal parts um, of a pig carcass uh, and this is the, the um, reaction mechanisms of glucose as it drips down to its constituents of ethanol uh, and acetate. And this process, as you're probably aware, um, well aware of, goes um, is very lengthy with a lot of supervital reactions. You have algal mortis, rigor mortis, liver mortis. You have the stages of decomposition. You have fresh, bloated, active, advanced, and skeletal. And all through those processes, you see um, this qualitative reactions that happen, but. As chemists, sometimes you aren't able to visually see what's actually happening. And that's why I find this subject really fascinating because actually by instrumentation, we can actually explore the degradation process in a lot more detail. So when we look at the kind of the simplistic view of how a body decomposes, we have to kind of go back to our very basic chemistry um, reaction mechanisms and we look at proteins and how they degrade and they go through to that um, very building blocks of amino acids and how do they degrade um, and, and very similarly to kind of the fats which turn into triglycerides and the carbohydrates to the glucose and we can see that there are different reaction mechanisms depending on the environment in which they degrade. And this is very basic chemistry. If you expose different chemicals in different environments, you have a different reaction. This is very prominent in the glucose where you can see, if I just kind of move you guys down here, you can actually see that as we start to degrade glucose, there are alternative reaction mechanisms depending on the oxygen availability. So you can see that as a result of aerobic, degradation of glucose, you have carbon dioxide and water. Whereas alternatively, when you have a deprived environment of oxygen, you have those esters and those um, alcohols that are being produced. So this is really interesting when we're starting to look at how a human body starts to degrade because you have a large variation of these different types of proteins, these different types of fats and these different types of carbohydrates that start to degrade. And how can we actually put, build these up to building blocks to start to understand how a body decomposes? Now we talked about um, some of the forensic applications and I'm gonna to touch on these uh, in the next two slides. Now I worked with uh, Cumbria Police Force uh, and we were looking at uh, establishing whether you could train um, cadaver dogs both on land and on water. So these dogs are actually um, have the skill to indicate to remains underwater as well as on land. And we were looking at what kind of train aids they were to be using, how they were actually storing them uh, and how what the training process. And my part in that was very light touch in terms of kind of advising in terms of the chemical variations that may take place. 
um, and that, um, they were absolutely um, brilliant in terms of their training and their attitude to kind of learning. But it just demonstrates that actually there must be a common uh, denominator within these samples for these dogs to actually detect. And so where they are now in terms of a, an organization is that they've then got fully trained dogs that can detect underwater and on land, which is absolutely incredible. But from a chemistry point of view, we're lacking that knowledge. What is it that they're indicating to? Is it a series of chemicals that are similar or are they varying in their nature? And that's what we're, this is what my um, whole research field looks to underpin. Post-mortem interval, so time since death, um, a very sensitive um, subject for, for some, um, particularly forensic pathologists. Um, um, when you're a forensic practitioner, this is kind of the, the golden question. Um, how do we approach this um, with such variations in environments in, in which bodies are found? Um, current techniques look at the entomological approaches. Um, so looking at the life cycle of the blowfly. Um, and obviously that's an area of expertise that, again, I'm not touching on that subject because there are specialists out there. Um, but they look at the, the life cycle. Um, and traditionally, you would look at the stage of decomposition. But again, there are variations of that bait down to the environment in which that specimen is in. Now, I'm not kind of a very kind of speaker in terms of just me speaking at the audience. Um, so I want the audience to actually get involved. Now, if you think about a banana and you place it in a variant environment, that banana, regardless of which your environment is in, will always go the same color. It would always ripen and decompose in the same color um, fashion. Does anyone know why that is? Let's have a look at the comments. I'm always fascinated by, how do I look at the comments? Let's have a look. Um, let's stop sharing. Um, where's the comments chat? So if you can put some comments in the chat, why do you think that a banana, and there is relevance to this, why do you think that a banana always ripens, sorry, always um, degrades in the same color change? It's had some conversation. This isn't me just chatting at you. Should we just have some comments, some interaction? This is how we learn as people. Anyone want to have a guess? It's okay if everyone's shy, we can warm up. No? Dead, 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 dead. wait for that comment. Okay, you're all just really shy, that's fine. So what it actually is, is the, I'm just gonna um, go back to share my screen. Oh, we do have some. Yes, so we do have comments um, because of the complicated substance in that. Yes, so it's this, yes, exactly. So it's the ethylene um, environment that causes that color change, regardless in which the environment that, that banana is in. So you always have that color change, regardless. So that that itself does it also change to them? Yes, it does. Yeah, um, there will always be, oh hello, Mila. Um, there will always be that color change, um, there will always be oxygen present, that small degree. And for that biochemical reaction to occur, only, it only requires that small volume of oxygen. And this really underpins some of the research. No, I didn't want to do that. Why is that coming like that? And da, 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 this one, yeah, sure. Move this. Apologies for this, everyone. This really underpins some of the fundamental biochemical um, theories when under 
undertaking some of these forensic taphonomic uh, studies. So is there a similarity in bodies as they decompose? Is there a difference? Can we establish that difference regardless of the environment? It is? But how do we measure that? How do we quantify that? How do we qual qualitatively measure what is actually happening as the body decomposes? Because the biggest question, and I'm all thinking it, the environment significantly impacts how a body decomposes. You have weight, you have different mediums in which the body is buried, whether the body is clothed, um, whether there is a large variation of insect activity around that body, the weather. So many variables impact how a body decomposes. How do we take that back and start to look at the fundamental biochemical reactions? And I actually was able to do this by taking it back to the basics using laboratory controlled conditions to measure what the gaseous products from a decomposing cadaver. Uh, using um, pig specimens as a human analog, what we were able to do was seal a pig specimen into a 220 litre seal drum placed on a set volume of soil inserting a set volume standard um, gaseous mixture into the barrel so it still has that um, introduction of um, gaseous initial gaseous material as it starts to degrade the the, the um, carcass those gases are then emitted and transferred across this heated line into our analytical instrument from there, we're able to extract the volatile organic compounds using solid phase micro extraction, and then desorb the VOCs that we have extracted using SPME onto our gas chromatography mass spectrometer instrument. And that gave us our profile. And we did this from day zero to day 14. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do any um, uh, longitudinal studies, because as you can imagine, you're in a lab, and although we sealed the, the, the drum um, extremely tight, there was still some um, uh, gaseous uh, content being leaked from the barrel. However, we were able to take it back to the fundamental basics. So, the temperature within the lab was controlled using air conditioning. The topsoil was um, the same for each of the environments. So we had two um, experimental um, setups. So for um, the aerobic experiments, we had a, a zero air um, cylinder gas go into the chamber. For the anaerobic, we had oxygen free nitrogen with the internal standard. Um, and these were sealed. There was no insect activity. There was no clothing, no restriction. So you're, you're isolating those variables that affect the decompositional process. And we performed triplicate sampling. So we took three samples per day for 14 days. Now, what we didn't have control over was the weight. We cannot breed these pigs that we have a, a specific weight uh, and, and for each of the, the two environments, we had the same weight. That was not possible. The humidity, we couldn't control. We had a small enclosed area with a large amount of soil with a carcass. We can't control that. And that's just make, making um, you guys aware about what those conditions were. We looked at the internal standard. The internal standard is key. And it's all about making sure that your method is, um, is valid uh, and has a large degree of reliability. And this part of that is the internal standard. And we can see here that it was fairly consistent for both of the experiments here. So this will be um, aerobic and this would be anaerobic. We we'll measured the average temperature within the laboratory and this is just 
um, an extract from one of the months that we measured the temperature and it is fairly consistent throughout um, that period and as for the experiments as well. So once we actually undertook the experimental study um, and the 14 days came to an end, we then excavated and we took soil samples um, from multiple layers as we started to remove the specimen and take samples from underneath the carcass. But what I wanted to do initially was to look at the specimen itself. What was the variation? So let's look at the qualitative aspects of this. So you could see rupturing of the abdomen region. So you can start to see um, some of the intestinal um, tissue come out of the stomach there. You can see this green discoloration across the specimen. Um, potential theories of that is the sulfur and hemoglobin addition. Another theory is that it's the uh, amino acid L phenyl alanine reaction with oxygen. And, and when we think about these quality, qualitative aspects of um, looking at friend taphonomy, we then, if we were to look at those theories, that green discoloration shouldn't be present in anaerobic. And we'll, we'll come on to that into the, the next specimen um, photographs. So we can see two kind of alterations there to the specimen. And that's just qualitative. How about we look at the biochemical variances now? So we looked at all of the compounds that were present. We aligned those compounds to all of the um, uh, chromatograms within that decompositional period. So you identify that a specific uh, compound is a compound X, and then you align based on the retention time to the retention index and align to that all the chromatograms. And that gives you an indication as to um, that compound present within your whole um, set of data. We looked at the um, peak areas of these compounds and looked at what the variants of these were across the decompositional periods. So this is actually a PCA um, loadings plot. Um, and basically PCA principal component analysis looks at variants across a given period. So what we see here is looking at the variation of the days. So what is it? Which day is where decomposition significantly varies? So what is the day where decomposition starts to initiate? So you can see this, this large um, oval shape that you see is day one to three. So not much biochemical variation. They're kind of very intricate. However, the separation of day one to three to day four and seven show that something happens on day four. There is a large spike of some biochemical um, inference on day four that causes that separation. And that continues from day four to day seven. Interestingly, after day seven, it then returns to a similar profile to that of day one to three. If we look back at our qualitative data, and I'm just inferring here, you could infer that what actually happens is this rupturing, which releases an abundance of these VOCs, causing that separation from one to three to day four to seven. And the reason why it then returns to normality is that those gases emitted from the abdomen region start to dispel. So it starts to um, return back to its original profile. It's a very interesting, in my opinion. Then we start to look at the anaerobic decomposition. We're looking at surface, remember here. And when we were looking at the qualitative aerobic um, specimen, we talked about that green complex being present. And we talked about the two theories, we talked about how um, there, are, there is a theory that sulfur reacts with hemoglobin and oxygen to create that complex. But there's also in the literature by Scoots and Pakowski 
that there is um, a reaction of the amino acid L-phenylalanine in the presence of oxygen that creates that green complex. So in essence, that, that vital um, substrate is oxygen. So in this, we shouldn't see any green complex, which is true. So we're starting to put that jigsaw puzzle together. We're starting to infer, we're starting to relate our biochemical knowledge to visualization. We're no longer using our um, uh, models of, um, uh, of kind of decomposition stages. We're now looking at actual quantitative aspects of taphonomy. Looking at the quantitative aspects of the actual anaerobic specimen itself, so looking at the principal component analysis, and this is the um, biplot, we're looking at separation one to three, very intricate, very similar to the aerobic specimen. And then we're seeing that variation again from day four to 10. However, if we remember back from our qualitative, we're not seeing that rupturing is very much preserved. So it insinuates again, so another contributing factor to, um, to support the theory that oxygen is a key player. Now we kind of, scientists kind of assume, yes, of course, oxygen is a key player, but how does it pay a factor? And this is what we're trying to underpin in this research. How much of a key player is oxygen? What is, how is it contributing? And we're starting to piece those puzzles together. Now, what's quite interesting in this biplot is that actually day 11 to 13, there's an additional variation between the other two phases that we see. So what is it that, that's causing these two variations? We don't have that rupture of the stomach. We don't have anything significant in the qualitative aspects of the pig decomposition pit specimens that we see. So what is it? And that needs further investigating. Now, PCA looks at variations of compounds across the periods in which decomposition occurs, but it doesn't look at whether there are any similarities in the compounds that you see within that data set. Now, what was prominent was that these sulfur compounds were present in each of the environments, but at different concentrations, and I, this is very important, and I'll come on to the actual chemical um, equations as to why these are important, but you can see the blue is the um, dimethyl disulfide. I'll just move this up here. The blue is the dimethyl disulfide, and you can see um, that large peak at the top, and you can see a significant decrease in the um, dimethyl disulfide. Again, with dimethyl tri trisulfide, which is the, the red um, line that you're seeing, and dimethyl tetrasulfide, which is the green. What's interesting in this is that you can see that there is actually a spike um, at day five and then starts to decrease in both of those compound concentrations across the decompositional period. So what we can actually um, extract from this potentially with further research is that could we potentially use dimethyl disulfide, dimethyl tetrasulfide in determining time since death? We've, in this graph, it kind of infers that from day zero to five, there's a gradual increase. Then there's that decrease. But what actually is um, the most interesting part of this graph is that you actually see an increase in the sulfide on day 12. So does that, is there an additional spike or is that just an anomaly? So again, I always get back, N equals one in each of these environments, which is just what you do with the data and how you can extract from that. Now, the reason uh, dimethyl disulfide and dimethyl trisulfide and dimethyl tetrasulfide are all interesting is because their presence within um, that environment, within the barrel, is a result of an oxidative reaction. 
Uh, and this oxidation reaction occurs from methionine, uh, which then degrades uh, in, the, uh, in the presence of methionine lysase to create methane thiol. And then this methane thiol then oxidizes to create dimethodosulfide and water. So if we go back to this, this graph again, we can see that oxygen is a vital player in the um, process of degradation of specimens, as it's significantly um, less in the dimethyldisulfide concentration and dimethyltrisulfide and dimethyltetrasulfide. So we can see a direct correlation. So we're starting to put the jigsaw puzzles together. Now, this is quite interesting. Now, um, it's always been thought that um, the uh, chemicals in which cadaver dogs indicate two is um, putrescine and cadaverine. Um, now, from all of those results that we um, extracted, we didn't see any of the um, substrates leading up to the production of putrescine or cadaverine. So the left-hand reaction mechanism um, is putrescine. So it's the uh, arginine uh, reaction mechanism, how it kind of substrates to the production of putrescine. The uh, right-hand side is the production of cadaverine uh, and how uh, it's the degradation pressure of cadaverine. So, Interestingly, we need to ask ourselves, is it an instrumentation or is it simply that the, these compounds are not present in decaying specimens? Because there are also factors that we need to look at, the properties of these compounds, their boiling points um, and the extraction methods, solid phase micro extraction. There are alternative techniques, but obviously the literature out there um, predominantly uses sorbent tubes. Um, but even then, we're still not seeing those compounds. But is it a um, problem in terms of the um, sorbent, sorbent technique? Do we need to potentially look at direct um, flow onto column to ensure that we're not degrading the product or the substrate? So all these factors, it's a brand new emerging field. It's been... Um, predominantly um, researched by researchers in Australia, so Shari Forbes, um, researchers in Hawaii, Kate Perrault, um, uh, Maiken, uh, who works at the after taphonomy facility. And even then, we're still not seeing the presence of these volatile organic compounds. So maybe we're not seeing them, but we obviously need to take into consideration the bigger picture. Is it our instruments? We also conducted additional analysis. So as well as, um, as well as just conducting the volatile organic compounds in the headspace, we looked at the soil. So what was the VOCs given off from the soil? We looked at uh, an ionic uh, content. So looking at what's um, what is the biochemical uh, content of the soil? And is that varied from the control soil? Because then you can relate to the um, actual degradation of the tissue that's then absorbed by that soil. And then we also exposed the soil samples to um, a cadaver dog unit who looked at indicating on these to see if the dogs um, if any of the chemicals within those soil samples, um, they were present. And this is just basically a, a table that concludes all of the compounds or the, um, the potential uh, indications made by the cadaver dog. So you can see very similarities between the two environments. So in the headspace, we can see that actually dimethodisulfide uh, and um, the sulfide series are still prominent in that headspace VOCs. In the soil VOCs, again, the sulfides are present. You start to see a link here. However, within the whole, uh, in the anaerobic environment, which is the second row, you can see you're starting to see that, that um, anaerobic degradation. So you're seeing that 
those um, carboxylic acids, you start to see those esters. Um, so you're seeing a variation of that kind of um, degradation uh, specimen in that environment. You then see uh, a very variation in the anion content in terms of what's actually leaching from the specimen. And very similar, you're seeing a variation um, in the cadaver dog response. However, you're still seeing compounds that are present. So although we exposed the um, samples to the cadaver dogs, we actually analyzed after to see if we can see if there are any similarities. And there were indeed dimethyldisulfide present in both those samples. The whole sulfide series, as you can, you're probably getting fed for me saying it, starts to emerge very um, consistently across this um, um, experiment. So it's hard to kind of not concentrate on what the actual re reaction mechanism is and whether that's prominent for um, criminal investigations. So just kind of ending the discussion, I don't know how much time we've got. Uh, we just kind of 36, we've got a bit of time, a lot of time for questions, but um, there's obviously variations in the sulfur concentrations between the two environments, um, but still present in each of the environments. Um, there's obviously variations in the presence of compounds. So when you see those compounds, there is a variation uh, within the time periods of decomposition. Uh, and if we're thinking about um, cadaver dog handlers and the use and the samples that they're actually um, applying to train the cadaver dogs um, and look at the biochemical results that we've got in this study, um, we need to start considering using more replicable um, specimens, particularly if we're thinking about bodies that have been um, placed in um, graves. Um, you haven't restricted oxygen and then potentially um, a different VOC profile. So therefore you're restricting the dog's ability to actually indicate to that specific area. So what I've actually done is actually um, taking that data and actually um, not enforced, but um, advised dog handlers who have cadaver dogs to vary the samples that they have. So they're now using buried remains. They're now looking at different depths and then they're looking at different size specimens. Um, all in the hope that they are going to cover that range of samples that they will come across in the um, investigative um, world. So in, in summary, uh, different environments from laboratory controlled decomposition studies show a variation in the compounds present um, when they are present. However, there are some chemicals that are present within um, each of those environments. Uh, current training aids for cadaver dogs aren't fully representative of what they are searching for. Uh, and there needs to be a big push to enforce protocols to ensure they have a range of odor profiles to train on. And again, you're gonna hate me for saying it, sulfide plays an important role in this implication of a new estimation of time since death. Um, and we need to explore that at, at greater depths um, to look at validating and exploring this reaction mechanism, um, looking at the fundamental biomechanics of how this um, compound is present and how we can use it in casework uh, and um, potentially revolutionize the way in which forensic science in forensic medical legal field is really portrayed. So I just want a special thanks to obviously University of Leicester where I took some of this research, um, the research council, some of the police forces that um, actually had cadaver dogs and gave me advice in terms of how to undertake this study. Um, and um, obviously the company that I currently work for was very supportive of the research that we're currently undertaking. Does anyone have any questions? And we do have, um, about 20 minutes of questions, which I'm more than happy. Um, I usually get um, a, a large number of questions 
So um, more than happy to take questions. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the nice presentation. Any no, participant, those who have the question, uh, you can raise your hand. I will unmute from here. Any participant? Any from the YouTube live? Okay. Okay, let me check the raise hand. Okay. Can got, any so, living things decompose in a space? Uh, can any living thing decompose in space? Um, you'd have to look at the, the kind of fundamental physics around space. Um, you'd probably be very preserved in space. Um, a variation of microbial, you know, that, that underpins much of why we see some of the volatiles that we see. It's that microbial speciation and that degradation and that process of autolytic um, and putrefaction um, processes. Um, but very good question. Um, I think you can, but it will be very macromolecular um, level. So yeah. Um, I shown in that picture when the pickers are green discoloration after it's dead, but can, can such reaction occurs if alive? Um, obviously, that reaction rec mechanism can happen. Um, um, fleshitis is a, a, a disease that you can actually have that discoloration. I've seen, um, but um, that's all I, that I'm aware of currently. Yes, so that, that's what I was referring to: potentially anaerobic decomposition in space, lack of oxygen. But we don't know that much in terms of the microbial space. So what is that speciation? How would it degrade in that environment? Who pressure? Who knows? We, we've not been able to explore that. I don't think um, our governments really want to be putting dead pigs in space and looking at how they degrade. I don't think that would be, I don't think they would really like that. For how long can you detect drugs in a decomposing body? Well, they've looked at entomological um, aspects of toxicology um but the near future you know we've only touched the surface in terms of detecting drugs in a decomposing body we don't know the answer to that but this is the very first steps in trying to establish that in terms of what is given off potentially we could look at what the the gas given off to see if there is any toxicology variation and that has been explored in many taphonomic facilities at the moment so i uh, can't give you that answer in honesty um rates of decomposition will be less but nevertheless anybody do even mm, Remember, the kind of microbial speciation degradation is key in that. Um, it really underpins what type of decomposition you have. Obviously, there's a lot of variation. We've never been done. It, it will be very preserved in terms of in space. Thank you. Thank you. Is it? No worries at all. Is this possible to preserve any living thing in the presence of oxygen? Yes. Embalming. Yes, again, that's biochemical embalming. You're, you're, you're in, in, kind of inserting those into the body to preserve the body. Um, what about payment indicators? Only blow fighters are taken currently. Yes, um, even that in a court of law in the UK, um, that is currently what has been used for post mortem indicators um, at very low temperatures. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree. But we don't know what we don't know we don't know in space at the moment i'm not very a kind of a physics -y person so apologize um uh, monitoring them in, in the cadavers can we comment on the time since death potentially uh, i'm not a microbial expert i'm a chemist um but that's something that um is being done um so mr wolf uh is it possible to preserve any living thing that presents oxygen if yes how um um, potentially, um, is this possible to preserve any living thing in the presence of oxygen? What do you mean by that, Mystic Wolf? Um, just kind of reword that a little bit. Um, at very, very, at very low temperatures. Yep. Yeah. Um, but remember, you still have a, a large microbial species internally, and you have a, a um, given temperature within 
your body. So it'd be interesting to see how that kind of autolytic process has happened when in that high pressure. I love how we're talking about bodies in space. Very interesting. Never thought about it. Um, that autolytic process and that microbial speciations within internally, how that would vary when you're introduced to space, how that how would change. Very interesting. Uh, something that I'm probably going to have to um, kind of uh, read upon. I mean, can we preserve any living organising? In, in mm, you can preserve the this, the um, the um, like we talked about embalming, but there was obviously there is a um, a limit to which you can preserve that um, tissue. Um, obviously, those chemicals start to degrade internally um, as you are buried, uh, and that's that's what will start to occur. So, um, yeah. Can liquid nitrogen be used for plasma of living things? Um, yeah, we've talked about obviously the microbial and um, keeping on Earth, you know, it's potentially you could, but you're potentially freezing tissue. What happened internally? Something to ask um, again. What kind of chemicals occurs in a charred body? Um, you're probably going towards more of an anthropological um, question there, which I'm, I'm not going to be answering. <laughs> um, but you, you have to think about the process of what happens to a body as it is burnt. You, you're, you're dehydrating the body. Um, there's been um, studies looking at what the VOC profile, um, how that VOC profile varies as you um, actually burn the body um, using accelerants. Um, and what actually it, it, what was found was that you start to see that high concentration of the accelerant, but actually you're only just seeing how the body degrades just like normal. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, you're introduced to hydrocarbons, et cetera, as accelerants, how you can dis dissociate that between the actual profile is quite difficult. Um, oh. Uh, what camera? Yeah, uh, I assume he assumed me meant prison bodies in the presence of oxygen. I was thinking embalming is pr is is preservation in presence of oxygen. Is it? Yes. Um, yeah. It to some extent. Yes. Um, that's what you're referring to. Um, embalming. It, it. I wouldn't want. To, I'm one of those people that wouldn't want to kind of divulge into a um, a subject like embalming. But yeah, I see where you're coming from. Any other biochemical markers to look up on decomposing bodies? Um, sulfide is predominantly that you're kind of definitely something that's in high abundance from decomposing body. Um, uh, I work with a group of researchers that looks at breath and there's a high concentration of acetone. Acetone is also um, a compound that is present um, in high concentrations. You're looking at carbon. Uh, carboxylic acids, esters predominantly, um, and aldehydes. Um, and no, thank you, no, no worries. Informative and interesting session. I'm glad I could provide uh, a session. Any more questions? Uh, I think we have taken all the questions. Okay, brilliant. And, uh, no problem at all, thank you. Uh, oh yes. Um, can we detect toxins in dead bodies, or have they been degraded by protease? This is an emerging field, and I'm not kind of gonna kind of sell you short. And is that it's something that probably needs to be investigated? Um, the taphonomic and toxicological um, interlink is very absent um, at the moment, and and, and you say proteases, what is that interaction in the microbial aspects as well? How does that, how do they link together and degrade? Does it degrade at a, a large rate um, for certain toxins and drugs? Or is it something that um, just kind of um, doesn't follow a uniform um, degradation? So something that's really interesting, something that needs to be researched out there. No? Brilliant. I'm glad that, you, yeah, brilliant. Good references for, to find me. Um, 
There is um, two books I would recommend. Um, there is one by um, Shari Forbes um, around um, post-mortem remains. Um, and there is one by, let me just look this up so I don't want to sell you short. Um, just bring this up, two seconds. And let me have a look. Not to sell. So um, one book, Taphonomy of Human Remains, Forensic Analysis of the Dead and um, the Depositional Environment. So that's by Eileen uh, Scootsman and Shari Forbes. Uh, and there is a, another one called Human Decomposition. Uh, human, um, human Body Decomposition by uh, Yarvis Heyman. Um, two of those are absolute Bibles uh, in taphonomy. So um, if you're interested in, in, the, in the world of taphonomy, which is vast and really exciting, I definitely recommend those books. So, thank you so much for taking wonderful session. I think we have covered all the questions asked by the participants. Yep. And uh, in <clears throat> last, we are going to announce that how you can get your certificate. But uh, before that, I like to thank you once again for taking out the time and giving a wonderful lecture, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, accepted uh, in a very good way by the other participants. With this, I request you to kindly accept the certificate of appreciation from Sir Law Institute of Forensic Science. Although we are in the virtual space, uh, but kindly accept this certificate uh, for uh, uh, giving a wonderful lecture on the topic forensic taphonomy. Identification of chemical biomedical for chemical medicine. Yep, brilliant. Thank you very much. So with this, I'd like to thank you all my dedicated team members, those who reach to the different social media. So we are getting, in every event, we are getting more than 2,000, 3,000 registered participants. So uh, uh, we have, we are growing day by day. Our team is growing day by day. So these are few members. So I just want to award the certificate uh, for my dedicated team also. Uh, Afreen, Amala, Amber, Anmol, Arti, Dr. Janika, Dr. Pooja, Palak Khan, Kanheri, Kratika, Laksh, Lakshika, Mabel, Neha, Minisha, Pallavi, Priya Singh, Raj, Rishika, Raja, Shivani, Tanya, and Rashnavi. So we have a dedicated team of uh, my volunteer, those who are reaching to the several platform and uh, getting even more uh, people benefited by this. Way. You all the part registered participants can download their certificate from the, our website, forensicevents.com. You have to click on the download certificate icon here. So by clicking here, you will get this box. Here you can put your registered email ID and by getting putting a registered email ID, you will get the option, whatever the event you have uh, attended in our uh, association or organization, you will be able to download all the certificates. Here you can download the certificate. With this, tomorrow we have again uh, have another session uh, on the role of forensic physician in the United Kingdom by Jason Penny and uh, World Know Him that uh, he is a specialist in the forensic medicine, the forensic and legal medicine. So tomorrow again, we will connect at 8.30 p.m. And uh, if this things will be go in a normal way because we are start living in a new normal, like we are connecting uh, from the people of the globe. And earlier it was not very easy to connect and attend the session, but now it's become a very easy for all of us. So with the, uh, you know, for, uh, with the cooperation of all the esteemed speakers like Jonathan, Jason, we are getting a knowledge from the international speakers also. Mm -hmm. So with this, we are organizing one, uh, uh, this International Biennial Symposium of the Association of Forensic Odontology for the Human Rights, and which is planned in September 2020. And if all these COVID and other situations will be fine, we will definitely invite all my esteemed speakers, those who have given, because today was the 22nd international lecture. So we are going to, uh, we have planned till December. So we have all the speakers already decided till December. And usually we do on the Saturday and Sunday. 
and luckily on this saturday and sunday we both day have the lecture so with this uh, i would like to thank you once again uh, uh, john for taking out time and giving the wonderful lecture i request sure. you to give the closing remarks thank you very much oh did you want me to do some closing remarks yeah no yep yeah. thank you very much for um allowing me to um speak today uh, and hopefully i gave you an insight into the biochemical aspects of forensic taphonomy and um, uh, any um, questions that I kind of missed, feel free to email me. Uh, I'm very open um, and hopefully I gave you that spark that um, colleagues gave me where um, I, I gained a love for a subject that I woke up every day and enjoy doing a subject. So hopefully for at least one of you, I gave that kind of spark to you. So thank you again uh, and good luck in the future.